on Wednesday evening as our church gathered in the town square to hand out cotton candy and popcorn and interact with the trick-or-treaters, I was struck by the multitude of costumes that showed up at our table. There were superheroes, there were zombies, there were doctors, there were all kinds of costumes. And one of the things I loved was when you had this little pipsqueak of a boy and he had the superhero muscles on. And you can kind of see they're a little deflated a little bit because there's nothing in the costume to fill up those muscles. But they come up there, they've got the mask, and then you hand them the cotton candy. And what happens is they take off the mask because they want to eat the cotton candy. And we got to see in that moment, behind the mask, who was actually there. In Matthew chapter 6, verses 16 through 18, the passage we're going to look at this morning, Jesus is challenging you and me to take off the mask and see who's actually there. If you have your Bible, I invite you to open up to Matthew chapter 6, verses 16 through 18. We're going to take a look at these verses this morning that actually wrap up for us a larger section in the Sermon on the Mount. And as we come here, as you turn to Matthew chapter 6, verses 16 through 18, I'd like to uh, give an aerial view of the Sermon on the Mount to kind of catch up to speed with where we are today. Uh, the Sermon on the Mount began with this uh, p- very provocative uh, picture of what kingdom people look like. People who've, who've chosen to make Jesus the king of their lives. Uh, you'd imagine, and the people in Jesus' day would imagine perhaps somebody powerful, somebody noble, Somebody strong, uh, the leader type. But we hear in the Sermon on the Mount, blessed are those who are poor in spirit. Blessed are the meek. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst. And what we've seen all throughout the Sermon on the Mount is that the kingdom of God is full of of unexpected people. But it's people who've made Jesus the king of their lives. And it's not about them per se, but it's about them having hearts that yearn for Jesus. And we see that the kingdom of God is really this upside down kingdom. That it's a kingdom that doesn't come through the the power systems of this world. But it comes through the self-giving love of Jesus. And so Jesus says there at the end of the Beatitudes that you, kingdom people, are the light of the world. You are the salt of the earth. You have a place here now. And and those words speak as loudly to us here in the 21st century as they did to Jesus' disciples in the 1st century as Jesus proclaims that, that the kingdom of God is here now, that people who've chosen to make Him king of their lives can make a difference. And then Jesus goes on to take the issue further by saying, unless your righteousness... And what Jesus means by righteousness all throughout the Sermon on the Mount is your practice of the kind of life that God wants of you. Your practice of the kind of life that you have as a kingdom citizen needs to exceed that of the Pharisees. Now the Pharisees were the holier-than-thou type. They were the the picture of piety in Jesus' day. And so Jesus is saying, not that you need to be more pious than them, but he's really pointing us to the reality that when Jesus talks about righteousness, when he talks about Christian living, he's got a completely different standard than what the religious leaders had. The standard of righteousness is not 
external, but it's internal. And so all throughout the Sermon on the Mount, there from uh, Matthew chapter 5, all the way through this, the section that we're going to finish up this morning, it's all been about heart issues. Jesus takes us deeper than external acts of righteousness, than external good works, and he's taking us deeper to the motivations, to the affections, to the desires of our heart. And what Jesus is really challenging us to do here in, when we get to Matthew chapter 6 is he's challenging us to take off the mask that religion so often puts on. And this is something we call hypocrisy. Hypocrisy, I, I, I shared this when we came to Matthew chapter 6. Um, it, there in Matthew chapter 6 verse 1, it says, Beware of practicing your righteousness before other people in order to... You notice that Jesus is pointing us to the, the, the motivation, not the action itself, but the motivation behind the act, in order to be seen by them. For you, then you will have no reward from your Father in heaven. And what we saw there in the beginning of Matthew chapter 6 is that doing the right things for the wrong reasons is worthless in Jesus' eyes. And what Jesus does here in Matthew chapter 6 uh, is he gives three examples of that. Now in Jesus' day, the, the, the big three uh, of religion were tithing, Giving alms to the poor, tithing, praying, and fasting. These were the big three. I, I, I would venture to say if we uh, tried to build a bridge, and, and this is sometimes what we have to do when we read the Bible, we have to build a bridge from Jesus' culture to our culture today and say, what is, what is Jesus uh, talking about in that culture? And think about our culture today. I think of religion often, at least in the evangelical church, the big three are probably uh, read your Bible, pray, and go to church. These are kind of the big three of what, what, what the marks of a Christian are. And, and, and so Jesus wants, what Jesus wants to do is he wants to take the big three, whatever they are, and he wants to go deeper. He wants to go to the heart. Why are you doing those things? He's not saying that doing those things are bad. In fact, they are part of what the, the Christian life looks like. But Jesus is concerned with what's beneath the mask. In fact, uh, hypocrisy all throughout Matthew's gospel is, the, is a main concern that Jesus has. And I'm concerned about it too. Because the reality is that all of us, to some degree or another, are hypocritical. Hypocrit hip hypocrisy, in, in the basic essence of the word, is a word that means putting on a mask. It's a word that the, Greek, uh, the, the Greeks used of actors who would uh, put on different masks throughout the Greek theater to be different characters. And so they'd have like one mask that they'd be in one scene and they put on a different mask and that was called hypocrisy. And that is what so many of us do in life is we, we put on a mask. We put on this front of either being religious or of practicing these things for the wrong reasons. And what it is, is it's masking an inner uh, sinful nature that Jesus is saying, that is worthless religion. Religion that is based on appearance is worthless. And, and he, he even, in, in, in Matthew chapter 23, Jesus gets very... Um, serious about hypocrisy. And this is what he says. He says, Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You are like whitewashed tombs which look beautiful on the outside, but on the inside are full of the bones of the dead and everything unclean. In the same way, on the outside, you appear to people as righteous, but on the inside, you are full of of hypocrisy and wickedness. Jesus' words are sharp. They go past the externals. And it goes to the heart. 
And Jesus is confronting what people viewed as the most religious people of his day. And he calls them whitewashed tombs. He's calling it garbage that is wrapped in a bow. And that is what doing the right things for the wrong reasons is in Jesus' eyes. It's wrapping garbage in a bow. And so this morning, as we wrap up this section in the Sermon on the Mount, and we've got exciting things yet to come in the Sermon on the Mount that we're actually going to continue in the new year. Uh, So this is going to be the end of this section, and we're going to take a break for the Christmas season. And uh, in the new year, we're going to continue, and Jesus is going to get real practical about things like anxiety, money, things like that in the Sermon on the Mount. But Jesus is wrapping up here in this section this this real... uh, sharp and pointed warning about the danger of wearing the mask of religion. And so what I'd like for us to do as we look here at Matthew chapter 6, verse 16 through 18, is really um, go, go deeper in the sense of, I would like us to really surface what it is that makes us hypocrites. And I just want to take a moment, and I know a lot of people watch this sermon online, so I want to speak to you guys just for a moment. And, and perhaps you're just curious about the church and what we're all about. And, and a lot of people, and it may be you, have this critique of the church that we're full of hypocrites, that, that we say one thing and do another, and I want to say to you that you're right. That the church is full of broken people, and I'm one of them. And all of us, to some degree or another, wear a mask where we try to pretend that we're somebody we're not. And the reality is that the church is not this museum of saints. It's a hospital for sinners. And that's what we're about as a church, and that's what the gospel of Jesus is about. And I invite you to listen in, because we want to really uh, surface this morning the lies that lead to hypocrisy. Because there are lies that you and I might not verbalize, and we would for sure not verbalize them here in a church this morning, but that we so often believe in our hearts. And I believe that there, there, there's some lies that, that we are prone to believe that lead to hypocrisy. So I'd like to take a look at those this morning. But let's take a look at Matthew chapter 6, verses 16 through 18. Uh, Matthew chapter 6, verses 16 through 18. That was a long uh, kind of introduction to where we are in the Sermon on the Mount, but I think it's helpful for us because Jesus is going to use the example of fasting here to surface this idea of hypocrisy and the danger of it. And I don't want us to miss the point. I, I actually preached a sermon this summer on, on fasting. And so I, I, I don't want us to miss the point that this passage actually isn't about fasting per se, but it's about the motivation behind practicing religion. So uh, verse 16 says, When you fast, don't look somber as the hypocrites do, for they disfigured their faces to show others they are fasting. Truly I tell you, they have received their reward in full. But when you fast, put oil on your head and wash your face so that it will not be obvious to others that you are fasting, but only to your father who is unseen and your father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. Now, fasting, we have talked about uh, here in the church before that it's a a spiritual exercise of of denying ourselves uh, the gratification of food or uh, it doesn't have to be food. It could be uh, something else. Maybe it's social media or maybe it's um, uh, just setting aside uh, time away from busyness, like fasting from busyness and that kind of thing. But whatever it is, it's denying ourselves that, that gra- the gratification of self in order to find our gratification, our satisfaction in God. And 
Jesus is pointing us to this practice as an example, just like he did in uh, verses uh, 1 through 4 with tithing, and he did in verse 5 with prayer. He's using the same model that he used in these previous verses to use the example of fasting. And what he's saying is, if you do this to be seen by others, you're wearing the mask of hypocrisy. And so as we look at these verses, I'd like us to ask, what are these lies that lead us to to actually do this? Because I would venture to say that no one sets out to be a hypocrite. No one has that ambition in life. You know what? I just want to be a hypocrite. But it happens because lies turn into a lifestyle. And so let, let's, let's look at some lies we believe. The first one is that being a Christian, uh, being a Christian is about doing the right things. Now, I want to unpack this a little bit because the Christian lifestyle, following Jesus, he calls us to holiness. And we've seen that in the Sermon on the Mount. He he says, you must be perfect as your Father is perfect. That was was just a few verses ago. And so there is this standard, but what Jesus is pointing us to is that the lie that, that often leads to hypocrisy is to believe that the Christian life is about checking the boxes of doing the right things. And the gospel reality that confronts that lie is that being a Christian is about a relationship. And I want you to see that here in Matthew uh, 6, verses 6 through 18, is that what does Jesus give as the alternative to hypocrisy? It's grounded in a relationship with our Father. Look Look at verse 18. Uh, he said, or verse 17, he says, But when you fast, put oil on your head and wash your face, so that it will not be obvious to others that you are fasting, but only to your Father who is unseen, and your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. When we uh, lay down the lie that Christianity, that following Jesus is about doing the right things, and that makes us a Christian... When we lay down that lie and we accept the gospel reality that's about our relationship with our Father, it's a game changer in how we approach it. And it doesn't mean that the outcome is different. Our lifestyle, if we believe the lie that Christianity is about doing the right things, or if we accept the gospel reality that it's about a relationship with God, it often looks like two very similar lives. But one is a mask, and one is real faith. And that's what Jesus is really trying to surface in us, is the kind of faith that's grounded in a relationship with our Father, where it's no longer about duty, but it's about love. And so, we want to confront that lie, because we know that doing the right things for the wrong reasons is worthless in Jesus' eyes. And so when it comes to practicing your faith, when it comes to things like the big three of Christianity, like praying, reading your Bible, going to church, Jesus is saying, are you doing it to do the right things, or are you doing it because you love your Father? So lay down the lie and embrace that gospel reality. The second lie that I I think we leads to hypocrisy is that we believe that the purpose of spiritual practices is self-gratification. Now this sounds very self-centered as as I read that this morning, but here here I want to I want to unpack this because I see this all throughout the church. Is that We believe a lie that the purpose of my spiritual practice is gratifying myself. This is one of the things I was struck by when I preached a few weeks ago on forgiveness. There is so much literature out there on forgiveness in in the Christian world about forgiveness where the sole focus is on 
how forgiveness is good for you. If you forgive, you will feel more free. And and I don't deny that. But Jesus is saying that if that is your motivation, is that really gospel forgiveness? You see, if if our motivation for practicing spiritual realities is self-gratification, then we have bought into a lie where we will put on a mask of I'm forgiving you out of the gospel, out of uh, the forgiveness, but it's really so I can feel more free. It's really so I can be liberated from that weight. And and I would challenge us to really see self-gratification as a lie that leads to hypocrisy. And here's, here's what... what how it plays out here in Matthew chapter 6 with fasting, is this is what people would do in Jesus' day. They would um, change their face. They would, they would make themselves look gloomy whenever they were fasting because they wanted other people to see, oh, that guy's fasting. He's really spiritual. Now, all of us here in the 21st century probably know uh, that, that that's not the way to approach fasting, that you're supposed to do it in secret because we've read Matthew chapter 6. And so uh, that's probably not a, pra- a practice that we would do is like make ourselves look gloomy so that people think we're spiritual. But beneath that is this desire that in my spiritual practice, I feel good about myself. And this is why I'm so concerned about that lie that we believe, is when we make feeling good about ourselves the reason that we practice our faith, what about when we don't feel good about ourselves? And this is what I hear time and time again when people uh, talk about, you know, I, I, I stopped reading my Bible because I stopped, I, I wasn't getting anything out of it. I wasn't, I wasn't, it wasn't, gratifying what I wanted from it. And the purpose, the gospel reality that confronts this lie is that um, the purpose of spiritual practices is not self-gratification, but God-glorification. The reason that we practice our, our, our following Jesus is not to gratify ourselves, but to give glory to God. But, but this is... This is I think this is really important, if you can't tell. Uh, if, If we get this, that the purpose of spiritual practices is God glorification... Uh, John Piper is actually really helpful for us because he has a saying that God is most glorified when we are most satisfied in Him. And so it becomes no longer about gratifying myself, what I get out of this practice, but it becomes about what I can give, how I can give glory to God in how I read my Bible, how I pray, how I go to church, how I share my faith, how I practice my spirituality. And, and I, let me just get real practical. Another area that people really do this self-gratification thing is in giving. Is, is we try to gratify ourselves by giving, by being hospitable. Or, and we, and we, what we do is we wear the mask of hypocrisy when we do that. Because we are doing it for self rather than God. And when we've done that, Jesus is saying, you are a whitewashed tomb. And so when we embrace this gospel reality that's about God glorification. We can say goodbye to gratifying ourselves, but what we will find in that is that we are more satisfied in God than we had ever been in ourselves. Another lie we believe that leads to hypocrisy is that I need to act like I'm more godly than I actually am. All of us know this reality, and even outside of the church, people know this reality. It's called the imposter syndrome. Is the, is it, we find ourselves perhaps in a profession or a field or a circumstance in life where we don't feel qualified, and so we feel like an imposter, and we wonder how we got there. And so in order to live up to that lie, 
we keep living the lie. I, w- I watched recently a, a fascinating um, uh, so, uh, biography. It was a, it was a gentleman. Uh, his name's eluding me right now. It's, it's the guy who the movie Catch Me If You Can is made about. Um, what is his name? Oh, but, but the actual guy. Uh, it's a, based on a true story, yeah. Uh, Leo. So, um, but the, the, the movie is made of this guy who, who basically lived a lie. He, he for, for several years, I, I, and, and if you, you get a chance, you can Google this. Um, I, will, I will remember the name after my sermon. But he, for years, he flew on airlines pra- pretending to be a, not, a pilot. And it's estimated that he, he flew on thousands of air, airline flights all over the world just pretending to be a pilot. And how he did it, and he, he tells this story, uh, he gave a talk at Google where he tells this whole story, and how he did it was he learned to talk the talk. And he started to live the lie. And as... As it went on, it became easier and easier. And he never actually like, flew as a pilot. He just flew on other airlines saying, I just need a lift to this other airport. And so he flew thousands of flights all over the world, but he learned to talk the talk. And then he learned to live the lie. And so many of us do this when it comes to spirituality is we learn the talk, we learn the things to say, we learn how to act like I'm more godly than I actually am. And before we know it, we're wearing a mask, and Jesus says, that kind of religion is worthless in my eyes. But but that's not the end of it. I I hope this message is not condemning per se, but it is an invitation into gospel realities. And this is the reality, is that authentic faith is about the affections of our heart rather than the appearance of our face. I got this language from Matthew chapter 6 because what they would do is, uh, in Jesus' days, they disfigure their faces. And the Greek word that's used in Matthew chapter 6, verse 16, that says uh, they disfigure their faces, it's, um, in Greek, the they often would use an alpha, which is like the letter A, before a word to make it the opposite of something. So um, so this word is, it's basically opposite of recognizable. So they make themselves unrecognizable, but what did Jesus say? To be recognized. And it's like this play on words that Jesus is using here. He's saying they, they make themselves unrecognizable to be recognized, to be uh, looked at as more godly. And Jesus' response to that is, wash your face. He says, don't do that. Anoint your head with oil, wash your face. And he says, stop wearing the mask. Because Jesus wants the affections of our heart more than the appearance of our face. In 2 Timothy, Paul picks up on this theme and he says, but understand this, that in the last days there will become times of difficulty for people will be lovers of self, lovers of money, proud, arrogant, and it's this long list of what people will be like as they they live these lies. And down in verse 5 it says, having the appearance of godliness but denying its power. And that is doing the right things for the wrong reasons. And Jesus says that's worthless, and not only is it worthless, it's powerless. And so the gospel reality is Jesus isn't concerned with you looking more godly than you actually are. He's concerned with, he wants a faith. It doesn't matter how simple it is, or, or how uncomplex it is. He just wants authenticity. He wants your real face. So Jesus' response to hypocrisy here in Matthew chapter 6, verse 17, is wash your face. And I'd encourage you that the practice of washing your face, as Jesus is telling us to do, is the practice of denying the lies that we believe. 
lay down the lies that you need to be more godly than you actually are. And embrace the reality that Jesus wants faith no matter how simple it is. And then one last lie that we see in this passage is the lie that the approval of others is worth more than the approval of God. And all of these lies sound preposterous for us to say in a church this morning. But how often we believe that. We believe that the approval of others of my life is worth more than the approval of God. And so it's easier to put on a mask and receive the applause of others than to practice faith in a closet and to receive the reward of God. And the gospel reality that confronts this lie is that the reward of authentic faith isn't glamorous, it's glorious. And I want you to let that sink into your heart and mind this morning, because the reward of hypocrisy is glamorous. You get the applause of others. But the reward of authentic faith is a father who says, come into my presence, well done, good and faithful servant. And that, my friends, isn't glamorous, it's glorious. And if we let that gospel reality sink into our hearts and lives, we can say goodbye to the whitewashed tombs. We can lay down the masks. And we can embrace this relationship with a father who doesn't want you to be, uh, to act more godly than you actually are. He wants your heart. And he wants simple faith. And he wants you to lay down the lies and take, out, take up a lifestyle of following him as our king. And so, my encouragement to you this this morning is is to never believe that you are immune to hypocrisy because the moment we believe that lie we find that we're living a lie and it's easy to learn to talk the talk and before we know it we're living a lie But when we lay down those lives and take on the gospel of reality of what Jesus is calling us to here in the Sermon on the Mount, we find that following Jesus is all about a king who's calling us and saying, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. I'm calling you into a kind of life that's full of freedom, that is full of, of the, not the imposter syndrome, but it's full of the meaning and satisfaction of a life that's not about a glamorous reward. No, it's about a glorious reward. God, we thank you for uh, this word. We thank you for uh, just the challenge that you give us here. And Lord, um, I pray that we would all lay down the lies and that we would embrace the relationship with a Father who loves us, who invites us into his presence. So God, um, I don't want to be a hypocrite. but I want to be the kind of kingdom person that you're calling me to be. So God, move my heart, move my affections. Help me to practice faith, not out of duty, but out of love. Pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.